Uh, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 33 tonight, and uh, which is a really interesting chapter. Last time I was with you guys, we were looking at that whole idea of in relationships of when is it okay for a Christian to lie or is it ever okay for a Christian to lie and and I gave you some different examples of of uh, it's one of those uh, yes and one of those no you know it kind of depends on the situation and it's not a situational ethic but it uh, um, it sometimes has to come out on the greater the side of the greater good but I want to ask you a question before we pray and get into our text tonight. If you're anything like me, and you've been in the Lord for any length of time, I want you to think about those times when you've come into church and maybe the message was just right, or you went away to a retreat, and it was one of those special times where you connected with God and you knew it. You knew that you had God's heart for the moment or that time, and that you knew that he had yours. And that during that time, there were some changes that took place, and you knew it. It wasn't something that maybe you could write down. It wasn't even something that maybe you could explain to someone else. But you knew that you had had an encounter with God, and you were different. Everyone here relate to that? Yeah, we all have. You know, that's exactly the story that we're looking at tonight. You know, last week, uh, Pastor James took you through Genesis chapter 32, and we saw that, that Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Now, don't just blow that off and think that Jacob was wrestling with some winged individual from heaven. The Hebrew brings out very clearly that this was what is called a Christophany. It's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And Jacob wrestled with Jesus Christ. Try to get your arms around that one. A little mind bending there. But he wrestled with the Lord. And the thing I love about that, those of you that have wrestled, we've all wrestled with the Lord on issues. The Lord wrestled with him. And they wrestled through the night till finally God prevailed. Imagine that. (laughs) God won. And God touched him in the thigh of his body and he crippled him. And as we're going to see tonight, that is what God does with us. There are things that God in our life, he touches our lives in such a way that we're not to be the same anymore. We're not to walk the same way that we walked before. Jacob, Israel, was to walk now with a limp. But yet we're going to see tonight that he forfeits that. And I thought, how many times do we do that? You know, Jacob is a chosen instrument of God. But he's no different than David. David had to make choices. And David made some bad choices. We look at Peter. You know, one minute he's on the high of the mountain. Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter gives this most fantastic answer, and the Lord commends him. And just verses, just a few verses later, Peter's denying the very Lord that he confessed who he was. The problem of duplicity. We all suffer from it. You see, Jacob had to learn a lesson that you and I have to learn. We don't necessarily fall in our strengths or just our weaknesses. We fall when we rely on the arm of flesh. When I stand in my own strength and I think, I can do this, and I don't need God to help me. That's exactly what Jacob's going to do tonight, and we're going to see that. And so when we look at These illustrations, the New Testament tells us that these stories have been recorded for our benefit, that we can learn from them, that I can look at the life of a Jacob and I can see David and I can see Paul and I can see Mike and I can see you. 
because we all struggle with this duplistic nature. Paul wrestled with that. He even cried out about it. You know, why don't I do the things I desire to do? And why do I do the things I don't want to do? It's because when we give in to the flesh and we allow the flesh to become strong, we render God weak. The Bible says that when I am strong, he is weak. But when I am weak, he is strong. And that's what we need to learn tonight. That's, that's what I want you to see in, in this text as, as we begin to look at this. We're going to see that the struggle in these relationships tonight, too, there are three relationships that I see going on here. There is one, the re struggle with relationships with other people. His struggle was going to be with Esau, his brother. We also see that there's the struggle with God of allowing God to be God, to allowing God to be the Lord. We call, we call Jesus Lord of all. We say the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if I say that, then that should imply something in my very life. If I claim that the Lord is the Lord of my life, that means that he is governing my life. That means I become the servant, and he becomes the master, you see. Otherwise, he's the Lord. It doesn't change who he is, but he's not my Lord. You see, I, I put myself in that position, and I begin to call the shots. So and then the last one is, is, is the struggle with ourself, the relationship with ourself. So there's the relationship with other people. There's the relationship with God. There's the relationship with other people. And another thing that we're going to see tonight, that even though Jacob had some really some shortcomings and some misgivings, that God would show himself to be faithful in Jacob slash Israel's life because God is faithful. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. Aren't you glad of that? I mean, we'd all been wiped out by now. We wouldn't be here tonight if it was based on my faithfulness. But the faithfulness of God, and, and so we're going to see tonight that uh, we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge that about ourselves. And, and, you know, as we prayed back here tonight, we were, you know, Lord, if there's someone here tonight that's struggling with that, you got an issue in your life. You've had those mountaintop experiences, and here you find yourself right back struggling with the same things. This is one of those great nights where you just go, you know, give it back to the Lord. You know, you're probably going to take it back again. Hopefully not, but you probably will, or you'll take part of it back, and then you'll give it back. But, you know, God is so faithful. He's so gracious and so merciful to do that for us, so... Let's pray. Father, tonight, Lord, we, we thank you that you've given us your word, Lord. <laughs> that, that, Lord, you've, uh, we, ha we have no excuses, Lord, as to, to say we don't really know what to do in this situation. You've covered every situation and more that we could ever experience. And, Lord, you've wrapped them up in this word that we call our Bibles. And, uh, Father, I just pray tonight, Lord, as we go through your word, that, Father, it would go through us. And, the Lord, if there are some adjustments and changes that need to be made, I know there's some in me for sure, that, Father, that we will allow you to be able to make those adjustments and to make those changes. And, Father, we ask those things in your precious name. We give you all the glory and the honor due you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk tonight about the problem of two natures. We all have them. Herbert, Herbert Lochner, a great uh, uh, theologian of yesteryears, described Jacob as the man of two natures. He said that Jacob is an outstanding illustration of the presence and the conflict of two natures within a single believer. Jacob is good and Jacob is bad. Jacob rises and Jacob falls. Yet in spite of his failures, he is a chosen instrument. 
You need to remember that about yourself. Every one of us that sit here tonight, if we have named the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, made him Lord of our life, we are chosen instruments of God. Every one of us. And no one is more important. There isn't one instrument here more important than another. We are all equal. You know, I love the, the saying that the, the ground at the cross is level for everyone. No one has to climb harder to get there. No one had to struggle harder to get there. Each one of us came on that same level ground. God forgave our sin. He gave us new life. He gave us eternity. And he made us chosen instruments. I love what John Corson used to describe us as. We're tools in a toolbox. And when God needs a particular tool, he reaches down for that tool and he desires to use it. And it needs to be ready to go. And that's what we are. We're just tools in the toolbox. Jacob was also a man of weakness as well as a man of strength. Jacob's life would reveal many sides. He was a man of guile, yet he was also a man of prayer and worship. Doesn't seem like it's like oil and, oil and water, isn't it? And yet... That's where we find ourselves so much of the time. Some would say that Jacob was a victim of his mother's partiality, found back in Genesis 25, 28, for it tells us that Rebekah loved Jacob. She truly was a mommy's boy. But you know what? Like I've told you guys in the past, none of us is going to be able to stand before the Lord one day. And as the Lord reads our good things and our bad things, we're not going to be able to interrupt him and go, but Lord, you know, this isn't going to make any sense, these excuses I'm trying to offer until you get my mother up here, because it's really her fault. We're not going to be able to do that. You know, I can appreciate if you were raised in a home that was, for lacking of a better word, dysfunctional. All homes are dysfunctional, <laughs> some more than others. Every one of us has a dysfunctional home. None of our homes were exactly the way they should have been. And none of our homes now are exactly the way they should be. Some are worse, some are better. And I can appreciate some of us may even been abused in our home, neglected in our homes. But you know what? When we come to the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when you become a Christian, you become a brand new person. And you need to leave what happened in the past in the past. That's where life began. It didn't begin at birth. It began at rebirth. God gave you a brand new life. And that doesn't mean that you won't have struggles with things that may have happened in the past. Every one of us sitting here tonight, if we're honest, we have struggles. I have struggles. But I can't blame it on mom, and I can't blame it on dad, what they did do or didn't do, or should have done and didn't do. I, I can't do that. When I stand before the Lord, he's going to want to know, what did you do with what I gave you? The Bible tells us that he's given us all things that pertain to life. In 1 John, he writes to them and he tells them, My little children, I write unto you that you may know that your joy might be full. Fullness of joy. He didn't promise me happiness. He didn't promise me easy street. He promised me in spite of all of the things that could come my way, all the struggles I still have yet to face, and you as well, if the Lord should dare. But he says, in spite of that, you can have fullness of joy. So we can't cop out and say, you know, maybe it was his mother. Every one of us, every man and woman here, will stand on our own. Warren Wiersbe wrote about Jacob. He said, Jacob forfeited six things in this chapter. I'm going to count them, and I'll make sure I hit all six, Debbie. She says, don't number them. You always leave one out. Number one, he would forfeit his limp. We're going to look at that. That limp, that was an outward sign. We're going to see how he did that. He's going to forfeit his power. Where is our true strength and our true power come from? It comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Jacob's going to try to pull something off here in his own strength. Number three, he would forfeit his testimony. He should have limped right out there to Esau, we're going to see tonight. And what he does, he bows himself seven times. And we'll look at the significance of what that means in the Eastern culture. Uh, he forfeits his tent. He ends up kind of losing his home in a sense. And the, he builds a house, as, as we see um, in the past. He wasn't supposed to be building a house. Where did the Lord tell Jacob, Israel, he was to go? He was supposed to go to Bethel, house of bread. That's where Jacob, Israel, was supposed to go. We're going to see he didn't quite make it there. He forfeited his vision. You know, when we don't do what God wants us to do, we forfeit our vision. Do you know that every one of us, God has a vision for us? We may not even know really what that is. I know I'm at kind of at a place in life right now. I'm wondering, okay, God, what is it you want to do with us? I mean, we're doing things, but do you want to do something different? You know, I kind of thought we'd be going off somewhere strange or weird or different. And, of course, I am going to Thailand with Dale. Had him over for dinner last night, and he's talking about snakes. They eat snakes when they get there. Oh, it's really good barbecued, Mike. Huh. But you gotta watch out for the gotta watch out for the poisonous snakes and the scorpions and the stinging insects and the don't write a travel brochure for anyone you're gonna take with you, Dale. I'm really I'm really starting to really question this trip. But uh you know, I'm at a point in life where camping for me is like uh, 400 count bed sheets. You know, it's, I don't even know if we have beds. Are they going to have beds there? No beds. No toilets. He goes, no toilets. He goes, they have holes in the floor and a place to put your feet. Great. That sounds awesome. <laughs> but you know what? God has a vision for us, and this is part of the vision, getting to go. You know, we don't have to go. We didn't have to go to Thailand. We get to go to Thailand. We get to go serve. And those are the kind of things that God just, he presents us with. We, we all get those opportunities. We all have people that we can share with. You don't, you don't have to go sit 23 hours on a plane to do it. I mean, the people are all around us. And uh, we just get to go do that. But he forfeits his vision and then the last thing that he forfeits, he forfeits the safety of his family. And we're going to look at that. That's especially true for us as guys. That, uh, you know, you see the same thing with Lot. Lot forfeited the safety of his family. And, and as a result, he loses his wife. And his daughters go all weird. And just the influences of choosing to live where he lived. Um, and so that's, in, that's important stuff. So we need to... Uh, we need to kind of keep that, keep that in mind. All right, chapter 33, verse 1. Now Jacob lifted his eyes, and he looked, and there was Esau, and he was coming with him. There were some 400 men. And so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and the children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. And then he crossed over and before them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, and he embraced him, and he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And there they wept. And he lifted his eyes, and he saw the women and the children, and he said, Who are these with you? And he said, Jacob speaking, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. And then the main servants came near with their children, and they bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and she bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. And then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. 
And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, and though I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Verse 11. Please take my blessings that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. And he urged him and he took it. And Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord, my Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard all, one day, all the flocks will die. <laughs> Sounds like a lame excuse. Please let me, my Lord, go ahead before my servant, and I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock um, that can go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and Seir. And Esau said, Now let me leave you with some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me... Let me find favor in your sight of my Lord. And so Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. And therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan where he came from Padam Haram, where he pitched his tent before the city. And he, brought a, and he bought a parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And then he erected an altar there, and he called it El Elho Israel. Interesting story. There's a lot of things there that uh, we can pull out of here that don't just, in a general reading, you don't pull out. I'd like you to notice how the, in verse 33, the name that is put there, it says, now Jacob lifted his eyes. What was the name given to him just about three verses back, three, four verses back? What did God change his name to? Israel. But what is he acting like here? You remember the story of Peter where we'd go back and forth between the names? Same thing right here. I wonder what my name is that goes back and forth with God as I make duplistic choices. I loved what one commentator said about this is that Jacob raised his eyes, but he probably should have raised his eyes just a little higher. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. What was Jacob doing here? As soon as he raises his eyes, he's just come off just, we don't know how long before. It's only a few verses before. It couldn't have been very long. He's, he's just wrestled with God. God has won. God has touched his hip. God has altered his walk. God, God requires him to confess what his true name is, his old nature, and then God gives him a new name. And what does he do? First thing is he strikes out. He looks up and he sees what he appears to be the enemy coming at him. Oh, my brother. Right, the one I swindled. Right, the one I cheated. Right, all of that's now coming back on me. What is he doing? He is forfeiting faith with fear. Did he not have the word of the Lord? Was he not told to go do what he would do? When he had met with God earlier, he had that conversation with God. God met with him and, and I will go if you will go before me. I will go if you will provide bread for me. He already had the promise of God that God would go with him. And what's the first thing he does when the pressure comes on? He caves. And I thought, man, God's been reading my mail. This is how many times we do that. God gives us a word. He says, Mike, this is what I want you to do. 
This is how I want you to do it. I will go with you. I will provide for you. I will be your protection. And I look up, and in the flesh I say, I can't do that. You're right. You can't do it in your flesh. More than likely, you can't. God wants to ask things of us that we can't do in our own flesh. Because God wants to be the strength in us that does it so that he will get the glory. So at the end of the day, I'll go, God, that was awesome. I could have never have done that without your strength. I could have never have done that without the mind of Christ in this situation. I couldn't have met with those people. I couldn't have shared the gospel. I couldn't have done worship. I couldn't have taught that class. I couldn't go to another country. I couldn't do that in my own strength, Lord. But because you're, you fulfilled your word in me, the word that you gave me, because you did that, Lord, I give you the glory. That's exactly what God wants. You know, one old saint said, in fact, it was Martin Luther, he said, prayer, praying about things that God wants to do in your life, prayer is not pulling on God's reluctance. It's appealing to God's willingness. God wants to do it. God wants to show himself strong. He wants to demonstrate himself to an unbelieving world, and he wants to use the vessels the chosen instruments, which we are. That's what, that's what this life is all about. That's the only reason for God to keep us alive. God doesn't need us down here on earth to just suck air and eat food. He wants to use us. He wants our life to have purpose, and he wants to get the glory for it. So I thought here, I put a side note here, I wonder how different this story might have been written if Jacob that morning in prayer had said, Lord, today before we strike out, I don't know what's out there, but I know that there are obstacles in this life. I just want to give this day to you. I want you to go before us. I want you to work through me. I want to walk in faith as a man of God. And I want to give you the glory for it. How different his day might have been had he done that. Instead of getting up that morning, striking out, and the first thing he sees, oh, here comes Esau. I don't know how he counted it, but looks like he has 400 men with him. And uh, he freaks out. And that's exactly what we tend to do sometimes. So he, Jacob, forgot the promise of God there. So he saw with his eyes, he forgot the promise of God, he forfeited faith for fear. In verse 3, then it says, And Jacob bowed himself to the ground. You know what? He didn't need to do that. In the Eastern culture, there's a ritual that is still done today. If a conquering king was to come into your land, you would bow before him. You would walk, bow, walk, bow, walk, bow, and you would do that seven times. And that spoke to that person full submission that you're a conquered foe and that you're pleading for your life. Now, what's wrong with that? Didn't he have the promise of God? He didn't need to be bowing to Esau. And what, you know, it's, it's so interesting as we see here that uh, he should have been limping out there. Why? Why should he have been limping? Because it would have been a testimony as to what, I'm sure Esau would have immediately gone, dude, what happened to you? Your walk is different. I thought, wow, how convicting that is. I wonder if people, when they see my walk, the Bible says that we're living epistles read by all men. If that's true, then there's something in my walk that they see 
that should be distinctly different than it was before. I knew the Lord. Do they see that in my life? Am I that different? Are there things that are no longer there and things that are there now that weren't there before? But instead of limping out there where Esau would have said, Jacob, what's with the hip thing? What's going on here? Oh, you're not going to believe it, man. I wrestled with God. I wrestled with Jesus Christ, literally, flesh on flesh. And he won, and he touched my body, and he changed my name. I'm no longer to be supplanter. I'm no longer to be deceiver. I'm now to be Israel, governed by God. What a wonderful testimony. I think so many times, how many times I have forfeited my testimony in a work situation. When I had an opportunity, when someone said something very pointed, and immediately I should have seized the moment and said, uh, no, I'm not that way, because God has changed me. You know, it's not in a prideful way that I don't do the things that I used to do. It, it's not that I don't find that thing funny there is some humor in it, but I also see there's a side to it that's not funny. And so I try not to laugh at those things anymore. And I've missed those opportunities sometimes. Sometimes I've spoken up and I've been too harsh. It's like taking the lid off the salt shaker and doing this when yet God wants to season our speech. You know, little by little, some people, and you have to know. And I think that's part of the leading of the Spirit. Jacob here was not being led by the Spirit. Jacob fully resorted to the flesh. The first thing he does when he sees, he goes to fear and he starts limping out there. So, you know, I can, I can fault him for this. I mean, I used to fault the Jews so much of the time. I'd say, how could they miss Jesus Christ? And, and how, many, how many times have I missed Jesus Christ? When he wants to do something, and I go, oh, no, I know he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want me to talk to that person. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. What do you got to lose? What's the worst that could happen? I mean, I've never been slugged for sharing my faith. What's the worst thing that can happen? It's like, oh, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Oh, God, Christian persecution. A couple of friends of ours took us to see a movie Tuesday night, and it was Tortured for Christ. Oh, baby. <clears throat> Some of these people, 14 years in prison, beat constantly every day. Every day for 14 years for their faith. And the, the, in Russia, the, the guards would look in, and if they saw them praying, they would go in, pull them out, drag them down, beat them senseless, or beat their feet so much they would never be able to walk again, and they would go right back to their cell and go right back into prayer. And in one of the scenes, the guard comes in and is yelling at him, why do you continue to do this? Why do you make me drag you out and, and beat you for praying? And he looks at the guard and he goes, I was praying for you. I'm thinking, persecution, persecution in, what is persecution in Roseburg, Oregon? It's a long line at Starbucks, God. This is terrible. <laughs> but Esau ran, verse 4, the first part of verse 4 there, it tells us that Esau ran. And I, I thought, this is interesting, because Jacob was standing now in the midst of answered prayer. Here his so-called enemy is running to him. What had had to take place in Esau's heart for that to happen? Who changed Esau's heart? God. Jacob prayed. He met with God. God gave him the promise. And here he's, he's in the midst of answered prayer, and what is he doing? He's crawling. <laughs> he should have run right out there, limped right out there, and grabbed his brother, is what he should have done. But 
I love the, the second part of verse 4. And they wept. God broke their hearts. God is restoring a relationship here. Chapter 33 is about relationships. I thought in my own life there's some relationships that have been broken over the years. And I thought, you know, I need to be the one to go back and restore those relationships. You know, the Bible talks about you that are spiritual. Well, who's the spiritual one? It's the one to whom God is speaking to at the moment, and he says, do it. You know, God's not looking for sacrifice. God's looking for obedience. So easy to sacrifice. Oh, Lord, I'll pray for him. In other words, Lord, I'll pray that you'll change their heart, and they'll come to me and apologize. No. How about you pray to me, I tell you what to do, you go and apologize if that's what, but I, they're the one that did the offense. I don't care. Go and apologize. What's, what's the best that could happen? You get your friend back? Amazing thing. So I've got a couple of those out there that, thank you, God, that you're working on in chapter 33. and verse 5, and then it says, the children to whom God, Esau asked this question, man, what is going on? Where did all these kids come from? What is, what is all of this? And I love Jacob's answer. This should be the answer of every parent. These are the children to whom God has grace, graciously given your servant. You know, the Bible tells us that children are a heritage unto the Lord, that they're a blessing. Isn't it interesting that how many people talk, if you're in the public, if you're in the secular workplace, how many times you heard people talk about, oh, what a burden children are. In fact, I'm, I'm at the gym a couple days ago, and the news flash on the, on the morning, the little trail line is, new figures show that in the state of Oregon, you must have an income of at least $77,000 to properly raise two children. Well, that eliminates probably most of us, doesn't it? What happens if you have three or four? Or if you're like the Nutsons, you know, you got a clan, you know? Does that mean that all of those children, oh, they're just so wanting. They're, you know what? God provides our needs. It doesn't matter what the state says. What the, I don't know where they come up with this number anyway. It costs you 100000 to put a child through college. You know what? I had two children that both put themselves through college and graduated with almost no debt. And yet I've had these arguments with people that say, well, you can't do it today. Well, they just did it a few years ago, so it can be done. Yeah, it's called work. They worked. They worked all summer, and they worked part-time when they went to school. And when they graduated from school, they had less than $2,000 in debt. Yes, it can be done. Children are a blessing. In fact, you need to tell your children. I hope Jacob... You know, he's telling others. I hope he tells his children. You know, one of the things our children need to really hear from us is they need to hear that they are a blessing, that they really are. God, has, God you've graciously given these children to me. You know, when you have an opportunity and, and your family's around the table, even if they're grown, I think as, as fathers especially, they need to hear us say, God, thank you for bringing the family together. It's so wonderful, these children that you've given to us, that we can be together again, Lord. Thank you for them. Continue to bless their lives. You know what? When we pass away, I hope it's not that they're going to be sitting around remembering mom and dad going, wow, they made a really good living. Wasn't that great? They bought us all that stuff. Or remember all the places they took us? That was so great. I would like to think that they would say, you know what? My parents followed Jesus Christ. They loved God. And as a result, they did the very best they could with us, just loving on us, instilling Christ into our lives, and trying to meet our needs that way. So in verses 6 through 11 now, we've got this ongoing situation going on. And then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and they bowed down. And then Leah came, you know... Things are put into the Bible in a particular order. And you need to stop when you see an order. Jacob is still doing kind of the little favoritism things here. Who did he put out in the front? 
He puts the maidservants out there with the kids. And then he puts, who is his favorite wife? Yeah, who is the one that took second place? Leah. Who's second? Leah and the kids. And then, ah, Rachel and Jonathan. So, you know, there's still some Jacob going on here. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, I loved what one commentator said. He said, it makes you wonder what he told the maid servants going, you know, you guys are so special, I'm going to put you out in the front. Because <laughs> you're going to be really blessed out there. Yeah, you'd be the first taken out if that's the way it goes. So, what's going on here is Jacob is now trying to barter with his brother in a sense to kind of try to buy forgiveness. In the Eastern culture, when there was an offense done, a present was required to be given to the offended party. And so Jacob now is taking these things. I loved what uh, David Hawking said about this. If you actually added up all of the goods that he's trying to give Esau, it would have been the equivalent of five oceanfront houses in Newport Beach and a garage full of Ferraris. This was no small offering. This was huge. And he's trying to buy off the offense of his brother, who really wasn't even offended. I mean, Esau... Uh, said he had been blessed too. He had, he had more than he needed. But if the gift is not accepted, there is no guarantee the offense is forgiven. It must be received. And so Jacob doesn't want to lose this moment. No, I want you to take it. If I have found favor in my Lord's eyes, take this from me, please. And so Esau understanding what's going on there, then takes the gifts. And then in verse 12 through 16, let me read that to you. And then Esau said, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak, and that the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flocks will die. Uh, he's worried about the flocks and he's worried about the children. There's something interesting going on here in these verses. And I was kind of drawing back to something that Chuck used to teach us. And it was about... There will be people in your life when there have been offenses or things have gone on, and even though forgiveness has taken place, you will cho still choose to hold that person at a distance. And it doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven them. It means that you might be walking in wisdom. I don't know if you can kind of get what I'm getting at, that's, that you just don't want to find yourself in that setting again to where you're going to get blindsided by something. And that appears to be what's going on here because what's going to happen is Jacob's telling Esau, just go on ahead, we'll catch up with you, and as soon as Esau takes off, Jacob takes a hard turn and he's going the, a different direction. He doesn't want to meet up with them again, and they don't. The sad thing is here is that he doesn't wind up where he's supposed to wind up. Look at verse 18, it says, And then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is the land in the land of Canaan. Words have meanings. Did he go where he was supposed to go? No. Where was he supposed to go? He was supposed to go to Bethel. He goes to Shechem. But yet, look what happens. It says, then Jacob slash Israel came safely to the city of Shechem. There's your illustration, guys, of when you're not faithful, God still is. God kept his part of the bargain. He kept him safe. The sad thing is here is that 
next week, when Pastor James is taking you through chapter 34, you're going to see this cost him the virginity of his daughter as she would be raped there as a result of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, as she would go strolling through the city and a man would, would be attracted to her and he would take her. So the whole thing of that cost of disobedience that we as dads need to really take that to heart. You know, we used to, we were kind of taught as young Christians, we were told that as parents, the things that we excuse in our homes in, in moderation, our children very possibly will excuse in their life in excess. That as they see that we begin to waffle with God, because you know, your children at a very young age, if you're teaching them the Bible, they will know if you are compromising. They will know by your actions. They will know by your speech. They will know by the way you do things. You know, if you're in the grocery store and the clerk actually gives you $5 too much change back and you walk out of the store and go, wow, isn't God good? Look at that. No, you just shorted the clerk five bucks, buddy, and you need what your child needs to see. Your child needs to see you walk back in and give that to the clerk and go, you know what? I think you paid me too much here. Because at the end of the day, the clerk has to make that up or it goes against. I, when I was a grocery clerk in high school, when we counted out our tills, if our tills were short, if we didn't have the money to make that up, no one was asking us to do that. It went on a report, which went to the corporate office if you got a few, uh, too many of those, you were suspect that you were either taking the money out of the till or that you were a bad checker and that this probably wasn't the job that you should be in. And so, you know, our kids see those things. They need to, they need to see if we're living up to what we claim that we are. And then, so he comes into the city in verse 18, safely into the city, but this is where he loses his vision. God had told him, Israel, I want you to go to the city of Bethel. I want you to go just outside Jerusalem there, into Bethel. That's where I want you to be. He chooses not to do that. And I want to give you a few points um, of what that brings us down to. One of them is that Partial obedience is really full disobedience. If God asks you to do something and you just do part of it, you've kind of wiped out whatever it was, the obedient part. That, uh... So what did he do that was commendable here? In verse 19, it tells us something that is commendable. Even though he wasn't in the right place, it says that he bought a parcel of land, and there he pitched his tent. Why was that important? What was the promise that was given to grandfather Abraham? The land was promised. Jacob was the instrument that was now part of the fulfillment of that promise. By buying the land, he was actually demonstrating that he believed the promise of God. He was investing in what God said he was going to do. So he, from his own wealth, he took and he bought a piece of land. But what is the second thing that he does there? In verse 20, it says that he erected an altar. At this point, Jacob is actually acting more like Israel. I love what John Corson says about, about men who build altars. He said, men who build altars become altered men. And that's true. When you build an altar, when you worship before the Lord, when you open your life up and you ask God to come in and you give him those areas of your life and you offer those things on the sacrifice, you become an altered man. Raul used to tell us that the problem with with Living, living sacrifices is they too often crawl right back off the altar. 
You know, when you put that thing on the altar, you need to crucify it. You need to say, God, I want to be dead to this thing. And then you need to leave it there. So whatever it is, whatever that thing is that you have here tonight, that you might have, that uh, you need to leave it there. But uh, I want to give you a couple points to send you out of here with tonight. What did Jacob learn as a result of this lesson? Or what should he have learned? And what can we learn from here? Number one, that a true relationship with God is worth a hard night of wrestling if you discover your true nature and your true name. God desires to give us a new name. So, you know, notice how it happened. It says in verse 24 that he, Jacob, was alone. In verse 27, it's, it says he wants us to confess our true nature. You know, God was asking of him. Jesus was literally asking him, what is your name? In other words, what is your gig, Jacob? What is, it, what is your nature? He knew what his name meant, and he wanted him to confess it. I'm Jacob. And uh, Jesus wants that of us. He wants us to confess, you know, I'm Jacob. I'm the schemer. I'm the deceiver. I'm the liar. I'm the tricker. I'm all of those things. Be honest with God. It's not like he doesn't already know. You know, when I confess something to God, it's not like he's going, wow, you're worse than I thought you were. I mean, in reality, when we confess things to the Lord, isn't it true we know that still back here in the files, there's still a couple other things he wants us to confess, but we don't? Well, when I get over these things, God, then I'll bring these things out. Reminds me of a true story that uh, we had some friends that worked at the IRS, and this was an actual letter that they got. Someone wrote the IRS, and they, they anonymously, with a big check, and they, and they said, uh, not a check, but a, like a money order, and they said, you know, uh, we, my wife and I have come to the Lord, and, and we've been cheating the government on our taxes for years. And so the Lord really convicted our heart that we needed to, to get right with you guys, and so I'm sending you this check. And then he puts, P.S., if the conviction continues, I'll send in the rest. You know, it's like, it's like you know what? God wants it all. Whatever you've got back there in your file, God wants you to give it to him all. You know, he wants to cleanse you. The Bible says in 1 John that he has cleansed us from all sin. If that's true, if he's, if he's forgiven you of all of the sin, then why not confess it and give it to him? You know, just get over it. Number two, Jacob learned that there is no true change in life until there is confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, and I love this word, all unrighteousness. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you sit here tonight and you don't know that you totally, truly haven't ever given your life to the Lord, all you have to do is go, God, I confess I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Come into my life. It's that simple and he does and he will. That's it. We make, we make salvation so difficult. God didn't. Number three, he learned to ask God to bless him in verse 26 of chapter 32. I will not let you go until you bless me, he said. Such boldness. I love that. Do you remind God of his promises? You know, it's been estimated that there are about some 7,000 promises that we can actually claim. Do you know them? Can you recite any of them? They're no good to you if you don't know them or read them or claim them. They're just literature. God has recorded those things for you and for me to be able to claim them. I love that David reminds God of his word. 
<laughs> Isn't that cool? Hi, God. You wrote this. This is your word. You said that you would do this. I don't think God takes offense when we remind him of his word. Number four, Jacob learned that to, to give God credit for the blessings in his life. In chapter 33, verse 11, he says, God has dealt graciously with me. You know, it's in our nature, especially as men. I don't think women suffer from this so much. But men have this, this problem of we take, want to take credit for what we do, what we've learned what we've accomplished. In fact, what's the first thing men always ask? You know, well, what do you do? Well, I do. You know, and, and I'm not saying that all that's bad, but I'm saying at the end of the day, when you look at the stuff that you have, the things that you've been able to accomplish, maybe an education that God allowed you to get, whatever it is, the family that he's given you, it wasn't that you deserved it. It's because God dealt graciously with you. And you need to just thank him for it. You know, as a, as a, my kids are all grown now, but isn't it a wonderful thing when your kids come up and they thank you for something and they're really appreciative? You know, you're, oh, well, honey, what else would you like? Did you need a car or something? You know, it's like, you just, you're like so blown away and it just makes your heart feel so good when they thank. Well, imagine how God feels when we go, Guy, thank you, God. Thank you that I got a paycheck this week. Thank you that I have health today. Thank you that the car started and it got me safely to where I needed to go. Thank you that I could come to church or whatever. Just being gracious enough to thank God at the end of the day. Another thing, number five, that he was learning, he was beginning to learn obedience. In, verse, uh, in chapter 32, 9, he says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and I will deal well with you. Obedience brings blessing. He was slowly learning this. He still is going to have some, a little tough time ahead of him. But, you know, he buys the parcel of land. He erects the altar. And number six, he became a man who built altars. We, as men, need to be men who build altars. You as women need to be women who build altars. We need to be a people of prayer. That's some of the things. You know, the name that, that Jacob slash Israel gives the place where he builds the altar, it's loosely translated, and I love the translation is, God is God, he can do anything, God is God, and he is my God. And I thought, that's amazing. What a wonderful thing to say. God is God, and he is my God. It's like the psalmist in Psalm 32. For the Lord is my shepherd. That personal relationship. That he's not just God. He's not just some, some force out there. He's my God, and he loves me. Father, tonight, Lord, as we come to your communion table, I pray, Lord, that some of these attributes will certainly be operating in our lives, Lord. That, Father, that uh, we can make that proclamation that you are my God and that, Lord, you can do anything that you want to do. And uh, Father, I pray tonight that uh, we would just give you that opportunity in our lives. I pray, Lord, if we've got some things back in our file cabinets that need to be brought out and fully taken care of, then Lord, there's no better time than communion to do that, to just give those things to you. Lord, that's what this communion is all about. It's to remember what you did. You paid the ultimate price for those shortcomings in our life. Not just that original sin, Lord, that we needed to deal with, but Lord, for the sins we traffic in each day, Lord, the, the bad attitudes, the misguided words, those things, Father, that sometimes just come so easily to us in these duplistic natures. Father, I pray, Lord, that, uh, Father, tonight, uh, during this time of communion, just work that special work in each heart, Lord, 
And may we just give those things over to you and allow you to truly be the Lord Jesus Christ in each life. Father, we ask those things in your name. Amen.